get more radical with age and men get more conservative. <laughs> That's what Gloria Steinem said in an interview she did with the Telegraph newspaper, a British newspaper, in March of this year. And when I came across that quote, most likely on social media, it really grabbed my attention. And I began to wonder, well, why? Because wondering why is what a person like me loves to do. I'm an academic. I'm a mature woman who's just started her PhD at Simon Fraser University with the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Now, why do women get more radical and men more conservative? I think as men go through life, they retreat behind the castle walls, and they're going to fight to protect the power and privilege that they've enjoyed over their lifetime. Women, as they go through life, realize they're just beyond those castle walls, and their struggle is to bring the barriers down. So it has to do with power. But what do I mean by power? There are any number of definitions you could come across, depending which disciplines you're familiar with, or which reference books you consult. But when I'm talking about power, I'm talking simply about this. It's the ability to live our own lives, and not to accept simply to live according to the standards and the rules set by others. Now, this idea I got from the work of Michel Foucault, and in academic circles, you don't get very far talking about knowledge and power and society without running into the work of Michel Foucault. And um, I, I was really taken with his work. I'm, I'm not a Foucault scholar at all, but what I do know of his work has had a tremendous impact on my thinking, especially an essay he wrote in 1988 called Technologies of the Self. Now, when Foucault talks about technologies of the self, he's talking about that process we have of going through life, of collecting experience, of gaining knowledge. And we do that to, to get to know ourselves better, to decide whether changes are needed, but most importantly, to decide how we want to live our lives. And as I started to work with this essay of Foucault's, I started to think about travel. And I thought travel actually really functions as a technology of the self. Think about it. There's a pattern to travel. We leave, we have our adventures, and then we come back. And we either pick up our lives where we left off, or we start living in new ways. And there's long been a tradition of linking travel with learning. Because when we travel, we learn about the outer world, and that's the other. And we learn about the inner world, and that's the self. There was a time, for example, when travel was thought to be really important because if you could see things with your own eyes, you knew whether they were true or not. There's also a tradition of travel as preparing us to become adults. So you had the Grand Tour, for example, and that's where the young, rich men of, of aristocratic families in England would take off, whoops, <laughs> sorry about that, would take off for the continent and travel extensively before they came back home to pick up their duty and their obligation to family, to community, and to the empire. And funnily enough, Gloria Steinem's latest book is called My Life on the Road. And in that book, she tells about her, her experiences with travel and how they affected her and they affected her life. And when we read a book like Gloria Steinem's or any other travel account, those stand as the public testament of how that individual used travel as a technology of the self. But if we're going to talk about modern travel writing by women, there's one book that kind of stands out from, from among the rest, especially in terms of commercial <coughs> success. And that's Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. Now, when Elizabeth Gilbert released Eat, Eat Pray, Love in 2006, she, she shared her story of travel and transformation with the world. There are over 10 million copies of the book in print, and I likely don't have to tell you that it was made into a feature film with Julia Roberts and Javier Bardem. But the interesting thing about the book is the very passionate responses it gets. And people either hate the book, or they really love the book. And when I first read it, I loved it. And I thought there was a message in there about faith and belief that really deserved a closer look. But as I worked with the text, as I dug deeper for my masters, my feelings got more complicated. 
And that's because I realized Eat, Pray, Love was not really about travel. It was about self-help. And it kind of captures a, a pop culture formula for <clears throat> happiness. And that formula really, really worked for Elizabeth Gilbert. When she left New York, she'd gone through a terrible divorce, she'd ended a love affair, and she'd had her own experience with depression. And she came back after eating great food in Italy, and she made a connection with God in India, and she fell in love in Bali. And she came back with a book that took her right to the top of that pyramid of international celebrity. She even went on tour with Oprah. But Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Eat, Pray, Love, is about how she fixed her broken self, how she healed what ailed her. And so in her work, I saw a, a movement in travel writing from learning to advice to self-help. And the essence of self-help is exactly this. There's one way, there's one recipe that anybody can follow to solve all their problems and make all their dreams come true. So what's the problem? The so what is this? Eat, pray, love, and that pop culture self-help formula, that recipe, um, puts the entire burden of transformation on the shoulders of the individual with no consideration for underlying conditions. There is nothing in Elizabeth Gilbert's book about social injustice or social inequality except on a very individual basis. And I think we see this in pop culture, this tendency to give individual answers to very complex problems. And I suspect that this is distracting. I suspect that this might make women a little bit less radical and less willing to tackle the challenges that we face. So what's an example of a mixed message in pop culture? Let's take the song by Beyonce, where she talks about girls are going to run the world. And every time I watch the video for that song, I cannot figure out how girls are going to run the world if they're trying to fight in stilettos and with no body armor on. <laughs> but a young woman challenged me on that, and she said, well, what if the message is that women can do the impossible? And you know what? She's right. But my question would still be this. Why should women have to do the impossible just to claim their power as equals? Now, here in British Columbia at some high schools, Young women in grade 12 will start a Facebook page in September. And that's to, to show off the grad dresses they bought so that they don't show up in the same outfits in June. Well, that's fine. But to me, that's putting more emphasis on the dress than on the 10 months of hard work they have to do to earn the right to wear that dress. And if life is all about the power of the dress, how do we teach young women about the power they need to tackle the obstacles that life will throw in their way. That their lives will be much more profoundly shaped by things like access to higher education or affordable housing or their own personal safety than it ever will be for that one dress. So for every pop culture message that we get, that it's up to us to fix ourselves, that it's up to us just to lean in that it's up to us to pay more. In addition to the taxes we already pay for things like health care and yeah. education, then we are being led away from fundamental notions about how our democracy is meant to work, to take care of its citizens, especially the most vulnerable. Now, women have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And we're not going to get there on our own, and we are not going to get there by ourselves. Because it's never been just about you, or me, or him, or her, or they. It's about all of us. And we're more connected than we've ever been before. Women need to seize the power to define how they want to be in the world, and how they want the world to be. Because power is a lot more than answering questions like, what will I wear, or, or, or what makes me feel good, or 
or who am I? Power is about claiming that right to make our own life choices. And as active citizens, using that power to make sure the social conditions exist for others to do the same as well. Power is not about seeing ourselves as broken. Power is about seeing ourselves as valued and valuable. Power is not just about our personal happiness. It is about social justice. Power is taking what we know and what we learn, whether that's through travel or any other means, and making the world a better place for everybody. Because, to paraphrase that famous feminist, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, <laughs> Because it's 2016, because it's time to get radical, and because it's time for all of us to live at that castle together as equals. Thank you.